Well, good evening to each one of you. If you would, open to Psalm chapter 10. Psalm 10 is where we'll pick up here in just a moment. Thankful for the presence of all. Thankful for our visitors with us. We're going to pick up here in Psalm 10 and here in verse 4. I want you to notice there are three things from this passage that are connected. And in Psalm 10 and in verse 4, he says, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. As you look there in verse 4, there's three ideas that I mentioned that are connected together. There is unbelief in God, there is wickedness, and then there is pride. You can imagine the situation where you have someone that becomes so full of pride, they start becoming wicked, and what do they do? They just say, well, okay, God's not there. They're not interested in him anymore. You remember in Psalm 14 in verse 1, he says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. It's not that there isn't a God, it's that he no longer acknowledges that there is a God. And tonight as we discuss the idea of pride, that's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to be talking about it some, but that pride can lead us into these type of actions, to wickedness and also to where we don't even need God anymore. So as we think about pride this evening, I want us to be absolutely clear what we are talking about. Because there's a lot of times where we use the word in an innocent way, right? Where we say maybe you're proud of your work, or you're proud of your family, or you're proud of your church, or things like that, or you're proud of your grandchildren. And today on Mother's Day, what are we proud of? We're proud of our mothers, right? That's especially something we're proud of. That's a normal, innocent use of the word pride. But... There is this feeling of satisfaction that comes from a job well done, from a family well raised, that is to be commended. I mean, when you get to the end of your life, you've lived 70, 80, 90 good years to look back and see the good job that you've done with your family. That's something to be proud of. It's something to to have pride in. Now, they are good given that they're kept in the right bounds, right? But when the Bible talks about pride, it's talking about something different. And the sin of pride that is laid out in Scripture is an attitude of arrogance. Our self-importance, our an elevated self-worth, where you think you're worth more than you actually are or more than other people. This person thinks that they're great, but they don't have any real basis for that claim. This person thinks they're better than other people. They compare themselves to other people. Well, okay, as long as I'm better than them, right? And as you think about that, they're also stuck up. They have an unbalanced view of themselves and of their importance. It's a pretty ugly thing when you think about all the description, right? That's what pride is. But when you think about this type of attitude, you can look here in Psalm 10 and realize that with it, if you have pride, it is impossible to reverence God in the proper way. Because it's all about you, right? It's not about God anymore. It's about you. And it is impossible to serve Christ. If I'm interested in myself, it's going to be hard for me to get down on my knees and appreciate my maker and serve him. That's why when you look at these three in Psalm 10, they're associated together. Where you have this pride, it leads to unbelief and it leads to wicked actions. To summarize simply what pride is about, it is the sin of an uplifted heart against God and man. And you know... Pride is kind of one of those things that we connect it with humility because the opposite of pride is humility and humility is the opposite of pride. And we talked about this uh, seminar, Sermon on the Mount class, but it's one of those things that's so hard to grasp. Whenever you're thinking, okay, I finally got my pride under control, what's happened? I've fallen subject to it. Look at me, I'm not proud anymore. Well, you've gotten right back in the situation, right? It's one of those things that, of, of all the things that we deal with, it is one of the most wily, and it's kind of like that wet bar of soap that just kind of keeps slipping out of your hand that you can't really grab very well. Well, the thing is, when we feel like we have it under control, what happens to us? We're enslaved again back to this mindset. Well, our desire tonight is to help us know what this is and to help us avoid this destructive mindset. And personally, I will give you a bit of insight into where I have heard this lesson before. I was at the Loop at training, and we had Warren Berkeley in for a meeting. And I heard him bring this lesson, and it was so good talking about these four kinds of pride that we're talking about tonight that obviously I wanted to share it, 
but it is it helps us to get our mindset off of ourselves and in these different aspects and drive back to the type of attitude that the Lord wants in his people. So tonight, let's talk about four kinds of pride. That's what we're going to discuss this evening, and I hope you've got your Bibles ready, and we're going to be turning over to 1 Corinthians, is where we'll turn here in just a minute. What I first want us to understand is its connection to the devil. If there is one thing that pride is known for, at least in the world and even in Scripture, it is that it is a snare of the devil. And we could use that in a couple of senses. It is first off what the devil is known for. It is known for his is known for his denial of God, denial of God's will, and his interest in himself and his affront to God. It is a pride issue for the devil. But as well, it is a snare that he uses in people's lives. It is a way that he works in our lives to snare us. So as we think about the snare of pride, particularly the first type of snare that the Lord or that the devil will use is that of intellectual pride. Let me define that for you. When we think we know more than other people, but this is just our perception. It may or may not be fact. There may be people out in the audience you know way more than I do or, or vice versa. And really, we go to every aspect of our lives. You know, if I talk to uh, Billy about rolling carpet, or I talk to Dean about Caterpillar, he's going to know infinitely more than I do, right? Because of the, the different experience levels that we're at. But when we think we know more than other people, and it's our perception, again, it's not based in fact, or where we, where we think we are so great, because of what we know. If we, if we go through and we pride ourselves, again, it's not saying that we don't have accomplishments, but let's say we go in and you have the PhD or the doctorate there on your door and the first person walks in and you go, hey, look over here. And you're pointing out all the pride that you've got in those things. Is it wrong to be intelligent? No. But whenever we think we're better than other people because of our intellect, we are in dangerous, dangerous territory. This mindset is destructive to our submission to God and our serving others. I mean, just think about it. It'd be hard for a person who trusts in their own intellect. Uh, Look at me. My wisdom, my thinking has gotten me to this point in my life. How is he going to acknowledge a greater intellect in God? It's not going to be very easy if he thinks he's got the whole bull, pull me up by my own bootstraps attitude, right? Or it's by my own intellect that I have achieved this level of greatness. He's going to have trouble understanding and appreciating God. But have you ever seen someone with that type of attitude get down on their knees and be thankful and appreciative to God or serve his brethren, maybe like Jesus there washing the feet, that type of thing? Do you ever see someone with that? If they have that type of attitude, that's not the kind of actions that they have because of their pride. It's hard for people with that to serve others because they think they are so much better and so much more deserving than these individuals. Well, that was a problem in the town of Corinth, but it was also a problem in the church at Corinth. Let me give you three different instances in the book where he addresses this. Chapter 1 is where I want you to turn. In 1 Corinthians 1 and in verse 26, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Think about what he's saying there. Of the people according to worldly standards who are the highest in the intellect, how many of them are Christians? Not going to be there very often. How about nobility? Maybe not. we won't have the uh, actual standardized kings and queens and all that in our country, but we do have kind of uh, a class of people, right, that, that rules. And even in other countries we see it at least. How many of those people are Christians? Not that many, right? As you think, it's not that they cannot become Christians, but what gets in the way? 
Sometimes it's position. Sometimes it's it's pride, isn't it? Thinking we know more. And as you look at what he describes here in 1 Corinthians, is people who thought that they knew how God should operate in saving mankind, the Jews and the Gentiles. And the thing that he's saying is, that's not what God wanted to do. He used the things that are not, the things that look like they're trash. He's going to use those to shame the things that are, according to the way the world looks. Continue with me in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he addresses this again here to this church. As he has talked about making sure none of our boasting is in men, but that it be in the Lord there back in chapter 1, again here in verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They are futile. Let no, so let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. So what is he driving at? The same idea. Do not boast in men, boast in God. And then in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, this sums up the attitude. You could go to other places where this church was proud. You could see it in chapter 5, but again here in chapter 8 and verse 1, he says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love Edifies. What's he talking about? He's talking about people who thought they knew better, people who thought that, in fact, they knew better than God and how it was to be. And, in fact, that is intellectual pride. Now, be clear again with me. The argument is not against education. If you've got your Ph.D. or your doctorate or your master's degree, good for you. Those are good things. You can use those in a good way. It's not about using your mind. I am not wanting an unintelligent audience. I want an intelligent audience that is critical and and analyzing. It is not against collecting information. We want you to study and we want you to grow and we want you to learn. The problem is, is when you think you're better, you're greater smarter and wiser than other people's just because of how your intellect is. Paul said, let no man glory in men. And that's in all kinds of men, but especially in ourselves. You know, having a sharp mind, while it is a great thing, it doesn't actually mean you're automatically going to have good character. Um, There's a man, his name is Robert Sternberg. He's a Yale psychologist, and he edited an interesting book called Uh, It's only my son in the audience, so the children may not uh, appreciate this name. But he said, Why Smart People Can Be So Stupid. He edited that book. He showed that intelligent people, according to IQ scores, they have really high, but they're actually very susceptible to foolish behavior and really unwise behavior. And what he concludes in that is that intelligence without certain moral virtues can actually lead to terrible behavior. Uh, Think about it in your life. What are some of the smartest people you know? Do they use that smartness for the glory of God? Have you ever seen someone that's really, really smart, but they're using it for all the wrong means? Yeah, it can happen if it's not attached to the right priorities. What he actually argues in the book is that arrogance can become their downfall. That's what happens. It's because they think they're so proud and they don't have these morals, they go and they act these crazy ways. Actually, one of the quotes in that book, it says, While IQ scores are rising about nine points per generation, people are not necessarily becoming wiser. They're getting book smart, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're street smart. Intellect has to be guided by God's word. Our conscience needs to be trained by the right standard. And our love has to be for God. And not just learning itself. Have you ever seen some people that they want to know, they want to constantly learn, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth, like over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. They're like the Athenian philosophers. They sit around, they're wanting to hear something new, but what happens? When the gospel comes to them, they reject it and they mock at it because it's not what they think. So, that is intellectual pride. And Paul said, let no one glory in men. So let's remove that. Let's make sure that we do not have intellectual pride. But let's also not have this, economic pride. 
Let me define that for you. When, we're, when we think we're greater, when we're more worthy, when we're better off or something along those lines because of how much money we have, because of the job, because of how long we've been there, or because of the possessions that we have. When we equate our value as to being better than other people because of the things we have, that's what we're going to have right here. It's economic pride. You know, some of the greatest people in the Bible had almost nothing. You look at Job, he had everything, and then what happened? Back down to nothing. And then actually the Lord blessed him back. But there were plenty of people that were poor, destitute, didn't have hardly anything. But they were not great because they were poor. Do you realize that? They're not great because they're poor. They're great because of their obedience and love and faithfulness to God. Poverty is not a sin, but riches aren't a virtue either. They're neutral. They're a tool to be used. The poor shouldn't think they're nothing because they don't have riches, and the rich definitely don't need to think they're better because they have them. Economic pride. Turn to James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, I want us to pick up here in verses 1 through 6. James here is talking about this type of person. It's not that riches are a problem, but it is what the rich can sometimes do with their attitude toward other people. And let's be clear, in the United States of America, we need to be absolutely clear that we can fall fall prey to this type of mindset. In James 5, here in verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. And your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. What is he saying here? Is there people who have put their, their pride, put their confidence in the things of the flesh, and all those things are going away. They're defrauding people. And look here in verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. person. He does not resist you. What do you see, see there? He's not talking about just people that are rich and using those things to the glory of God. He's talking about the corrupt rich that think they're better than others because of that. He's not talking about financial status. In Psalm 49, in verse 6, it says, Those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches. That seems to be the mindset here, that they have an attitude of they're boasting about the things that they've earned. But in Proverbs 11 and verse 28, he says, Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. It's economic pride. And if we think because of our economic status that we don't have to be submissive to the will of God, we're kidding ourselves. Let's continue on with our third one. It is that of self-righteous pride. Let me define that one. This is where we think we are so pure... We are so holy and we are so righteous that we look with contempt on the lowly sinners around us. That is self-righteous pride. Christians know what's right, but the thing we need to realize is that we didn't come up with the information. We to the world. That's not how it happened. Christians, faithful Christians, know they didn't earn it and they don't boast about it. They know it's a gift from God. Of course, in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, what did Paul say? We're saved by grace, right? It was a gift that was given to us. So we have no reason to boast on our own merits because of our righteousness. Remember what uh, in Luke he talks about there with the servant? He says, after I've completed everything, I've done everything that the master required, what is he supposed to say? We are unprofitable servants. We have done what is expected of us. That is removing self-righteous pride. You know, Paul said we are saved by grace, but do you remember what also he said in Ephesians 2 and verse 8? He said, not of works, that's earning it, lest anyone should boast. He's making sure that we understand our position. 
Nobody's saved because they're just so good or because their record of good behavior. And it's not because they did just such great things to earn it. None of us are going to be saved by that. In fact, anyone that is righteous now was unrighteous at one point, weren't they? Last time I checked, all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And the only reason we are now, the only reason we're righteous now, is because God came into our lives through the gospel and saved us. We need to understand and appreciate that fact. Personal boasting about how holy we are is completely out of place, and it's not the right attitude for a Christian. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3. Paul was writing to this church, and there are some that are priding themselves on their, on their merits based in the, Judaiz, Judaiz, um, the Jewish system. And in Philippians 3 here in verse 1, I want us to read down through verse 11. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate flesh. For we are the circumcision, okay, this is the people of God, look at what they pride themselves in, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. Let's pause there for a second. There's a group of people here in Philippi that are priding themselves off the things that they had done. And he says, we who are of the circumcision, we don't do that. We don't operate that way. Then Paul goes through and actually says, if we're boasting in the flesh, let me just roll out the scroll here and show that I am above everybody else just to humble these men. In verse 4 he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You know, there is a kind of arrogant, self-righteous, and a divisive attitude that's just not right. It's where we start classing ourselves into people. Well, I'm this type of person, and they're that type of person, and we're better over here than they are over there. It is evil and corrupt. And when we start thinking of how great and wonderful we are, we need to be reminded of what we have done in the past, of where we have come from. And if we have that attitude, we're in trouble. That is self-righteous pride. We don't need to have it, and it's not the attitude of a Christian. But the last one is this. It is that of national pride. Bible history teaches us what can happen when people fall into national pride. Now, let me be clear on what I'm talking about. There can be good forms of appreciation and loyalty and even patriotism to a set of principles, or to people that are surrounding us, our causes. I understand those. But when we let patriotism cause us to look down on other people because of their place of origin or their place of birth, we have crossed into an ugly, really nasty form of pride that's displeasing to God. Whenever we go through and we deride or disregard or degrade people just because of where they're born, We're stepping into a really nasty territory. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist actually ran into this concept of national pride with the Jews whenever he was talking with them. And in Matthew chapter 3, in verse 1, 
you had a group of people that are coming to John, and they're expecting the, I guess, the same way that the crowds that appreciated these men. And look at what he says here in verse 1, or picking up in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What are they saying? They're saying because Abraham is our father, because we are of the line of Abraham, guess what we don't have to do? We don't have to repent. We don't have to believe in your message. We don't have to respond, those types of things. At least you can see that they are not interested in repentance. They were so privileged. They were so special as the people of God that then whenever the truth came to them, oh, we don't have to change. You remember what his response was, though? He said, you're wrong. God's able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and he predicted that those people were going to be destroyed. That is national pride. When we think our position in a nation makes us either righteous or unrighteous, it is not that way. But this loyalty or this idea is what Paul is actually talking about in the book of Romans as well. And he deals with it not only from the Jews. He's going to talk about it from the Jews, but he also talks about it from the Gentiles. In Romans 11 and verse 18, he says, Do not boast against the branches. That's the Gentiles boasting against the Jews. And he says, Remember that you do not support the root but the root supports you. So the Gentiles were thinking, oh, okay, well, the Jews have stumbled at it. We've come into it now. We're better than the Jews. Again, that's not the right attitude either. Again, this class distinction between them. You know, national pride, again, wasn't only an issue for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles. And you see it in multiple of the letters that Paul wrote. But turn over to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, you'll notice here that he drives at the point that every member of every nation needed to respect the gospel call as God's divine act of mercy on them. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. But God's extending the hand to them, and they are receiving it. In Romans 11, he talks about this here in verse 30. He says, For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. You, in this context, is the Gentiles. There is the Jews. So they're saying, okay, it came to the Jews. Remember, Paul did this in the book of Acts. It came to the Jews. They didn't receive it. Then what does he say? He wipes off his feet and says, we're going to go to the Gentiles now. It was going to come to them first, then to the Gentiles. This is what he's talking about, the same idea. In verse 31, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. What's God doing? He's making the Jews jealous by saying, oh, you didn't want my gift. Well, let me go and give your gift to another person that will appreciate it. You ever done that with kids? Come up to a little kid and say, hey, I'm going to give you this toy. And they say, well, I don't really want that toy. Well, let me go over here and give it to Billy. Whoa, 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 whoa. I want my toy bag now, right? That's what's going on with the Jews and Gentiles here. And God is using that to bring them back. Look here in verse 32. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth and the riches of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You see what he's saying? It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or it's a Gentile. And last time I checked, none of us are Jews, so we need to be really thankful for what the Lord did through the Jewish nation. So we need to be appreciative of that. But it doesn't matter now whether you're Jew or Gentile. It's all going back to Christ. We're not better than anyone. But think about this. There are Christians from all over the world. I hear people talk about, I've been to the Philippines, talk about the work in India, or the work in China, or the work in Russia. You could go on and on and on. But they are our brethren in a way that is more important than any national relationship that we have. Do you realize that? You have people that you may not like. You may not like the Chinese government and stuff over there, but there's people in China that you need to love. You need to appreciate because they're your brethren in a lot more than a national way. Just keep in mind about these people, though. They weren't born here. They don't know our national anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance. They may not live in a government like ours. They may not even understand what it means to be in a republic. They don't know our founding fathers. You may be insulted just to think they don't know who George Washington is, right? But they may know their own. They are ignorant of our culture. They don't look like us. They don't talk like us. They don't even speak the same language. And they may look offensive to us because of the way American culture shapes our mindset. But I want to ask you a very serious question. Are we superior to those Christians? If your initial thought is to say, yes, you are right here in national pride and it needs to be removed. Because we are no better than the Christians in any other place. God forbid that we ever have that type of pride because we're Americans. We are just a group of people in in this region. But as Christians, we are all saved in Christ. You know, they are our brethren. And you know, the truth is, whenever we get to heaven, if we make it, it's not going to be Texas. Even though, you know, you have all these songs about Texas and how great Texas is, and I love Texas, okay? It's not going to be the USA, where the USA can have a lot of great things going for it, but the USA is not heaven, brethren. Heaven is heaven. And when we get there, we're going to be all in one place with people that in this life, we view them in the wrong way and we look at them with the wrong type of mindset toward the color or the way they speak or the way they act. We may not be there. But we'll be there in a place where there is no nationality. There is no worldly border one way or another or anything along that line, but we will all be there as brethren, praising God for eternity. It's a beautiful thought. But as you think about this mindset, I want us to go back here to Romans 12 to end our lesson. As we look at these mindsets, we can fall into them so easy, right? Didn't we just talk about at the beginning that it is the snare of the devil? It looks so easy. It's just we, can, we get ourselves in that mindset and we fall prey to it so easily. But in Romans 12 and in verse 1, Paul has made a conclusion off the fact that the Jews and the Gentiles do not need to boast against one another. And his conclusion is here in verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, the fact that he showed mercy on both Jew and Gentile, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service or worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may just... Dist- that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be changed fundamentally into the image of God's Son by the mercy shown to us. But look at what he says here in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. The mercies of God are supposed to do something for us. They're supposed to change us. And when we realize this whole life belongs to and should glorify God and be a sacrifice to Him, we're starting to get on the right track. But I'll tell you, brethren, when we sink to the level of pride, we have undone all the blessings that God has done for us. 
You realize that? As we look here, we have all been blessed, and we must do the opposite of what pride is. That's what he says here in verse 3. It's where we think about ourselves soberly, realistically, where are we? And the only way you can do this is by looking in the Word of God and realizing we're all sinners who are saved by the grace of God. And we're appreciative of that fact. And then we humble ourselves to do His will. This final verse is what I want us to consider in Proverbs 29. Because the danger of pride is this. A man's pride shall bring him low. Whether it's national or economic or intellectual or any of those, if we think we're better than other people or we're greater than the obedience of God's will, we will be brought low. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. That's the truth. Remember, you humble yourselves, and you're appreciative, and you're thankful, then God's going to take care of it. But I will say this. You know what the best news is? Here's your best news for your day. If you go through this lesson, you realize, man, I've been guilty of some of that stuff. You want to know what the great thing is? Pride, just like any other sin, can be forgiven. That's the great thing. That's the mercies of God there in Romans chapter 12. So the invitation is to you tonight. If you're not a Christian... Respond in the waters of baptism. If you're a Christian and you want to change your life, come back to him in some way. Won't you come to our gracious God? He appeals to you by his mercy. If we can help you at all, come forward as we stand and sing.